five years ago, I had the amazing privilege of taking um, a journey along the Grand Trunk Road. Um, the Grand Trunk Road, um, locals refer to it as the GT Road. It's in the Indian subcontinent. And it is the longest, the oldest, and the most famous trade and military route in the Indian subcontinent. I didn't go alone. I went with um, Tim Smith, who's a local photojournalist. And I'm an oral historian, so um, my job is to record people's stories, their experiences, their emotions, in their own words. So I use a digital machine. And um, alongside Tim's pictures and my um, words, we weave a narrative and we tell a story. Now, we've um, worked like this um, on a number of occasions, Tim and I. And um, every time we've worked together, we've been interested in documenting the history of the South Asian community in Britain. Um, you know, places like Bradford and Birmingham, and why, why people like me came to be here. Um, in this case, we were going to be producing an exhibition uh, which toured about five years ago, and we've only just got around to producing the book. And this is the cover of the book, and it's uh, the Grand Trunk Road from Delhi to the Khyber Pass. Now, every time we worked together previously, what would happen was that you know, we were looking, we'd be looking to interview some of the oldest migrants, the pioneers, the, the, the first person who came you know, from a particular clan to Bradford or Birmingham. And what we found was that whenever we identified somebody like that, you know, tended to be first generation elderly chap, um, he tended to be either a sailor or a soldier for some reason. And then the other interesting thing was that in their story, these gentlemen tended to talk about the Grand Trunk Road. And we didn't really understand why. So what we did was we pulled out a map of uh, India and Pakistan, and we actually um, you know, drew the Grand Trunk Road on there. Now, if you look um, at the map, on the little map in the corner, uh, where you can see all of India, uh, the line in red is the GT Road in its entirety. And you can see it runs all the way from Calcutta in the south to uh, the Khyber Pass in the north, well, in the, in the west, I suppose. Um, and the Khyber Pass is actually where Pakistan meets Afghanistan. And bang smack in the middle, you can see Delhi. Now, um, let me tell you a little bit about the Grand Trunk Road first. It's one and a half thousand miles long. So we, and we realized as soon as we sort of, um, you know, uh, marked this, did this line on there, that our particular area of interest was north of Delhi. Because north of Delhi, you've actually got the Indian Punjab, then you've got the Pakistani Punjab, and then you've got the northwest frontier province. So the GT road actually cuts all, you know, right through um, the heart of the, those regions. And um, we realized that that's actually the area from where the majority of Hindus and Sikhs from India, and about 90% of Pakistanis that live in Britain have migrated from. Um, so we wanted to understand why that was. Now, I just also want you to just have a look and see where Bombay is on that little map. You can see it's on the western coast of India. That's also crucial to our story. So just want you to make a note about where that is, especially in proximity to Delhi. I'll tell you more about that later. Now, if we look at the big map, um, there's no more maps after this, by the way. Um, <laughs> if, we, if we look at the big map, you see that's, that's actually the route that we took. It starts at Delhi, and it goes all the way to the Khyber Pass. So, on here, all the locations are the places where we stopped. Now, we, our journey took five weeks. It was me and Tim and um, a driver, a trusty driver, who didn't speak English, but you know he drove the car very well, and he was quite handy. Um, so it was the three of us, and we were there for five weeks, and we did 750 miles up and then 750 miles back. And we, so these are all the places that we stopped, either on the way up or on the way back. So from Delhi to Panipat and then Ambala. Now, Ambala is where my mum was actually born. Um, and then um, Lodhiana, J uh, Jalandhar, Amritsar. Now, those three places actually form the heartland of the Punjab region in India, and that is from where you've got the majority of Sikhs migrating uh, to, to Britain. And then Lahore, and you can see that little um, dotted line between Lahore and Amritsar. That's actually now where the GT road has been cut in two, um, because that is now the India-Pakistan border. And then if we carry on up north, Vazirabad, Jhelum. Jhelum is where my mum's family or originate from. Um, uh, I'll tell you more about that later. And then just, just a little bit higher up than Jhelum, you can see the Mirpur district. Now, the Mirpur district is very significant. Um, it's actually part, and you can see it's part of the Kashmir region of Pakistan. Now, 
About 90% of Pakistanis that live in Britain hail from that region. And you can see its proximity to the GT Road. Um, and then you can carry on up to Rawalpindi and then Atak. Now, that is the region from where my father is. That's where he was born. And the Chach district has actually, um, that is the region from where the second largest Pakistani community has migrated from. So again, that was critical to our journey. And then Saleh Khan and then the Khyber Pass and Peshawar up there at, at, at the top as well, you can see. So you can see that um, the homelands of the majority of people that migrated to the UK are actually dotted on the GT road. And we wanted to understand why this was. Now, the GT Road, for thousands of years, um, it's seen conquerors, um, adventurers, traders. They've all traveled along this route. Alexander the Great was here with his armies about 2,300 years ago. These are the famous decorated trucks that you see on, uh, on, on the GT Road. Um, they're the equivalent of um, our heavy goods vehicles, I suppose. But the difference is that these are you know, highly decorated. And um, there are actually hundreds of workshops, particularly in Pakistan, you know, that employ artists to paint these. And different re you, know, you can actually tell which region the truck is from according to its artwork and the motifs that are on there. And these trucks have um, you know, uh, intricate paintings of birds and uh, flowers landscapes, um, beautiful women, even poetry. The Mughals, um, they left their own mark on the GT road. Um, they left behind glorious buildings like this. This is the Jama Mosque in, uh, in, in Delhi. And then after the Mughals came the British. So it was actually the British that gave the road its current name, the Grand Trunk Road. Um, and Rudyard Kipling wrote about it. He described it as the backbone of all Hind. Hind is India. Um, such a river of life as exists nowhere in the world. Now, like um, previous rulers, the British used this route as their main archery um, you know, uh, in, in the Punjab and the frontier province. And um, they also built a railway track alongside the GT Road. And um, they built garrison towns or cantonments um, along, uh, along the GT Road to house their armies. And the officers, of course, they were all, um, they were all British. Um, but they recruited locals from the, the, the local farming regions um, as, as, the, as the soldiers. Now, remember we meant, I asked you to, have, to note where Bombay was. Bombay is where the East India Company um, had the headquarters for its private navy. So Bombay, actually, the port of Bombay, that became a very important link between India and Britain because many Indians worked on those ships. They were either tea wallers selling tea um, or they were shoveling coal in the, in the ship's boiler room um, or they were working as servants or nannies to um, the British families that were coming back from India to Britain. And so they became some of these Indians in the 17th century from there, then onwards, they became some of the earliest migrants um, from that region to come to, to come to Britain. This is the Indian Parliament um, in, uh, in the heart of Delhi, and this was built by the, by the Brit British. And you can see there the ambassador cars that are parked at the front. Now, let me tell you what happened in 1857, because that's an important date um, uh, in, 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 this, in this story. Um, the troops that were stationed in the Delhi region, they actually um, rebelled against their British officers in 1857. And the British referred to this as the Indian Mutiny. Um, this took about two years to suppress. It was a huge deal. And the British became very wary about this group. They were very suspicious of the group that had rebelled against them. And conversely, um, they really admired the groups that had remained loyal. And the ones that had remained loyal were actually the people that were the soldiers that had been recruited from the north of Delhi on the GT Road. So they were all the people from the Punjab and the frontier province. So the British distinguished them and named them as the martial races. And um, from then on, they actually concentrated their recruitment of soldiers from those regions on the GT Road. And that's how um, these particular areas uh, of the Punjab and the, the frontier province became so strongly associated with the British. Joining the army was actually um, a really prestigious job to have. Um, uh, it was a great option because you know, it gave you security and the pay was great. And um, some of these respected units actually went on to fight in France during the First World War. 
and um, a few of those soldiers actually went on to live in Britain. Now, this chap is um, too old, to, uh, too young to have fought in the First World War, but he did serve in the Second World War. And um, he actually got his job as a soldier because he lived very near an army recruitment station on the GT Road. So you can see, can't you, that those people that lived uh, along the GT Road had a much more cosmopolitan outlook um, than those people that lived in more isolated areas. And being near the, near the GT Road also meant that they had that contact with the British, which um, broadened their horizons, if you like. What actually happened in terms of migration to Britain was that um, different regions developed particular traditions in terms of how they, how they got here. Now, um, remember I told you my mum's father, he was from the Jhelum region. Um, and um, from the Jhelum region, the men tended to get work as soldiers in the army. Um, so my grandfather be became a clerk in the British Indian Army. And that's how my mum came to be born in, in the Ambala cantonment, because my, my grandfather was actually posted there at the time. And men from the Chach region, now that's where my father's family originates from, they tended to go to Bombay because there was a train station in Attuk, and they could get the train there to Delhi and then get the train across to Bombay. Um, so, um, uh, so, so the men from that region tended to get work um, in the ships. Uh, the, th that, that's what they did. And um, when the ship docked back in uh, Bombay after a big voyage, um, if there was a particularly good and loyal worker, um, the captain, you know, the... the uh, uh, the, the main man on the ship, he might say to them, uh, can you bring me back some more trustworthy men, men that you can vouch for, um, you know, when we, um, af at the end of your holiday. So that lucky man, um, and a few of these were from the Chach region, actually, they would go back to their village, and they sort of acted as these sort of informal recruitment agents. There was a word for them, syrings, and, um, and, you know, and obviously they'd give priority to the men in their own village, because those were the men that they could vouch for. So that's how my dad, my dad's father, actually got his job on a ship. And, uh, you know, he shoveled coal in the boiler room all his way to Britain. Um, and it, so it was that seafaring tradition which is responsible for my family actually ending up in, uh, in Bradford. So my grandfather's arrival in uh, Bradford actually coincided with the labour shortage here. Because when he got here, he got work very quickly working nights in the mills, in the textile mills here, and uh, they were crying out for more labourers. So, um, you know, him and men like him sent word back to their villages and said, you know, look, there's a fortune to be made here, um, you know, <laughs> uh, get, get, get here as fast as you can. But bear in mind that to be able to get here, you needed to have the airfare. So either you could actually get here via the army, you know, through work or through the merchant navy, or if you were going to, if, if you didn't have a job, you had to get, you needed your airfare. And most people didn't have that kind of money. So my grandfather, because now he was earning pounds, remember, um, he saved up very quickly and he sent for his son, my father, then he sent for his younger son, then he sent for a few nephews. Um, you know, this was a way of giving a leg up to um, family members. Um, and this was in the late 50s, early 1960s. Now, the, the area of Mirpur, um, that developed a seafaring tradition as well, because uh, there were already a few sailors from there settled in places like Bradford and Burnley and wherever else. And so, you know, they, they heard about this labour shortage and sent word back. Now, this coincided with something else that was going on in Mirpur, which was that a dam was being built um, at, at the time, in, and that was going to submerge the entire city of Mirpur. Um, it actually meant that about 100,000 people in the Mirpur region were going to lose their land, their agricultural land and their property, uh, but they were being given some compensation. So you see, these people, these men, uh, they had to re-establish themselves. Um, they had hard cash in their hands. At the same time, there were some kinfolk set already settled in, in various parts of Britain, sending word back, offering to give them that leg up. You can come and stay with me. I'll set you up. You know, my mill will take you uh, the day after you arrive. So it was a fantastic incentive for them. And that's exactly what many of them did. And that's partly why um, the vast majority of Pakistanis that live in Britain today are from the Mirpur region. Now, to this day, British Asians uh, maintain close links with their homeland on the Grand Trunk Road. Um, 
And even to this day, the bodies of um, first-generation migrants um, are still repatriated back to places like Mirpur. Um, uh, but the tradition is actually decreasing now because those elderly people are beginning to realize now that um, their children and their grandchildren are settled here for good and there's very little chance that they're actually going to go back regularly to visit their graves, which is a traditional thing to do among Muslims. Now the chap here, uh, uh, he actually um, travelled from Walsall to a village in Mirpur to get married and me and Tim were there to photograph him when he arrived at his bride's house. And in Delhi, uh, we met many British Indians who'd gone to take part in the holy celebrations there, which is the Festival of Colour. Now, older generations still want their families to have that link with the homeland, so they'll invest in a business or they'll build a house over there. But these houses are built with pounds, remember, rather than rupees. So, you know, they are, you know, so, so, they, so they are quite grand. And if you look carefully on this picture, you can see the water tanks. There's the one at the back, which is blurred, is in the shape of an aeroplane. Uh, I think the next one is, well, there's a bird at the front. So this theme of travel in places like Mirpur and Jalandhar and Ludhiana is, is a recurring theme. And that's how you can spot the places that, you know, where, where, the, uh, where the migrants live. And that's partly how me and Tim would actually operate. Uh, you know, we'd, we'd know which, which doors to knock on when we were in those, in those areas. But the irony with these houses is that uh, most of the time they lie empty because the owners are actually living over here. Now, we actually came across a number of factories on the GT Road that were manufacturing items for export to Britain. And these rugs were being made by companies, uh, you know, they were being made for companies like Next and Habitat and Laura Ashley. Some businesses believe it's profitable to use a name that suggests a link with Britain, um, whether such a link exists or not. Um, so a connection with Britain somehow gives this impression of better standards, better workmanship. So here you've got English shoes on top of the Union Jack that says um, British Jewellery Shop. That was the launch event we were attending. Um, and this one's my favourite. This is the <laughs> Piccadilly-themed restaurant in, uh, in Delhi. Now let me take you behind the scenes and tell you what it was actually like being there. So behind the scenes, uh, my role was to actually act as Tim's interpreter because he didn't speak the lingo. And I'd be doing crowd control, like you know, moving stragglers out of, the, you know, out of his shots. Um, and uh, Tim's role behind the scenes was to act as my chaperone, um, as my minder, and at times he even had to pretend to be my husband. This is Vazirabad in uh, Pakistan, which is also known as Mini Sheffield for its steel industry. And apparently, Alexander the Great's army stopped to get their weapons mended here, and that's how this cottage industry started. You can see, can't you, it's really male-dominated. Um, and, uh, I mean, it was a bit more relaxed in India. This was, this was in India, and here you can see I've got my dupatta very casually, you know, just thrown around my neck, and that, that was absolutely acceptable. We came across these men in um, a market in Delhi, uh, and they were celebrating Holi, the festival of colour. And uh, we met them at about 8 o'clock in the morning, um, and the market wasn't even open then. And these men were already high on some sort of Indian soft drink or something. <laughs> but we realised it was a really good photo opportunity, so we stopped to photograph them. And before long, um, I overheard a couple of them pl plotting to uh, smear me with this colour. Um, that, that they were throwing at each other. And so I quickly locked myself in the car and uh, left him to it. <laughs> so, and you can see they actually did, and I, and I took this p picture from inside the car. Um, so they got Tim and they got his camera and he wasn't very pleased about that. <laughs> now, um, particularly in Pakistan, if you know anything about that region, you'll know that there is no such thing as being single. Um, in fact, marriage is so important, in, especially in Pakistan, that people refer to the state of being single as being unmarried. And you just go from unmarried to married, and there you stay, and that's that. So people expected me to be married, and they expected me to be traveling with my husband. Because, I mean, just think about it. What respectable Muslim woman of my age is going to be traveling around India and Pakistan with a white man, you know, especially one that's not even her husband? Um, there were times when um, 
Well, actually, most, most of the time. I mean, Tim didn't speak the lingo, as I've said, and most of the interviews that I was doing were in Urdu or Punjabi or, you know, whatever. Um, and Tim didn't understand, but he had to hang around. Now, that wasn't for security, uh, you know, for my safety. It was actually to make the men, in most instances, it was to make the men feel more comfortable about speaking to, um, a, you know, a woman, a, wo a woman like me, which is something they just weren't used to doing in a lot, in a lot of cases. Um, so Tim's presence kind of diffused that awkwardness for them. It put them at their ease, and um, it meant that they could speak a bit more freely, which is what we wanted. Because, you know, you have to remember that we were the ones that were in their space. So it was up to us to make sure that we behaved in a way, you know, which earned their trust and their respect. And that also meant that, you know, we could then, you know, they would speak, they would open up a bit more and let us take pictures of their, their family and, um, and speak to me, you know, candidly as well. And there were times that I actually had to make myself completely scarce. And this is in Peshawar, which is seriously conservative. And we were in this you know, very, very public place. It was the bus station. And uh, in, in this case, I actually took this picture from inside the car. Um, so I had to stay in the car because it just wasn't the place for me to be, to be seen. Um, and uh, as I said, we had a driver who didn't speak any English. So um, this time, what I did was, you know, we sat in the car, and Tim explained, this is t that's Tim on top, of the, on top of the bus there. That's what he wanted to do to get a better vantage point. So I had to brief the driver in the car so that he could go out with Tim and uh, negotiate on his behalf um, while, I, uh, you know, w w while I maintained a, a low presence. That's me in the middle interviewing um, two elderly gentlemen about their experience of partition and we're surrounded by their extended family. Now, there's about 18 or 19 people in this room, and um, Tim spent like the two hours that I was speaking to them standing up, standing in the doorway because actually there was nowhere for him to sit down. And um, uh, the lady that's sitting to the, in, in, the, in the yellow clothes at the front of the picture, the minute I switched off my tape machine, she turned to me and she said, um, is the British a your husband? <laughs> And cause that's, that's how they referred to Tim. And um, I just, uh, you know, I'd learned by this stage just to sort of smile, uh, you know, demurely and just look down and, or look away and just, uh, just avoid saying anything and let them think what they wanted. Now, this is the Salikhana, which is very near Peshawar. And again, it's a very, very conservative area of Pakistan. And um, we realized too late that um, all the women in this region were wearing these blue, I call them shuttlecock burkas, um, uh, you know, and uh, these are the ones that you, know, you tend to see um, on News 24 a lot these days. So, and I was the only woman that wasn't wearing one of these. Now, don't get me wrong, I was actually wearing a big jadar, like a big shawl, which was the size of a bed sheet. Um, so it would completely engulf my head and my body, but you could still see my face, and I really stood out. And that just wasn't the done thing over there. And one of these women actually stopped me in the, in the street and shouted, you know, to the group that I was with, who is she with? And I was absolutely mortified um, that this had happened, you know, by my cultural insensitivity, if you like. So the very next morning, as soon as the shops opened, I actually went burka shopping and got myself kitted out. And the very next day, in my burka, um, we went to Vesa, which is in the Chach region. Again, it's quite conservative. And um, we knew we'd be speaking to a lot of men. This is in a roti house, and it's just off the, you know, just, just it's actually on the main road there. Mm -hmm. And um, these are all men who are actually, who spent years and years living in Britain. And the man sitting down on the charpai with the beard, he's actually from Manningham. And um, I was sitting opposite him um, on another charpai, with Tim kind of behind me, loitering, taking pictures and, and what have you. And remember, I'm in a burqa now, and all you can see are my, my eyes, everything else, I'm sort of, you know, draped in black. And, um, uh, you know, feeling quite proud of myself. And all of a sudden, mid-sentence, this chap stops and he says to me, that man, who is he? How is he related to you? And I just took a deep breath and, uh, and I thought, I'm going to have to lie for the first time, which I don't really want to do. So as indignantly as I could sound, you know, I said, he's my husband. And this man said to me, yes. I asked him and he said the same thing. 
And, uh, you know, thankfully he couldn't see my expression when he said that. And um, I just, you know, I just thought, do you know what, Sunshine? Even if I, <laughs> even if I bump into you in Oak Lane, you're not going to recognize me because thank God for my burqa. <laughs> just on a, on a final note, um, I said earlier that um, uh, my mum and dad were both born on the GT Road. And just quite organically, I ended up sort of, researching my own family history and this became very much my own story of migration to Britain as well and uh, I interviewed many senior members of my own family including an uncle of mine who now lives in Bradford and um, I asked him for his impressions of the GT road and this is what he said my village in the church was just off the GT road and when I was young and I crossed the GT road I had this longing to go somewhere I used to wonder how far this road went where it ended you know how it is when you're a child. I couldn't have been more than 10 or 11 years old then. There were no buses or trucks in my village, and nobody had a car. But whenever we travelled on the road for a mile or so in a tanga, you would see buses, trucks and cars, and I was really attracted by it all. I wanted to be in that car travelling down this road, and I would wonder what was at the other end. It was like seeing the M1 for the first time. Thank you.